In 2014, The Legend of Korra became the first mainstream American kids show to depict two queer female main characters in a relationship with each other, and it ushered us into a new era where shows like Steven Universe and Adventure Time are more free to openly depict queer relationships. But The Legend of Korra was never guaranteed to break down that barrier, and it almost didn't. This is the story of how The Legend of Korra made history. Following on from the success of Avatar The Last Airbender, the series creators Brian Konietzko and Michael DiMartino, collectively referred to by the fandom simply as Break, pitched a sequel of sorts to Nickelodeon. It would take place 70 years after the events of The Last Airbender, and it would feature the next Avatar, a girl named Korra. But the executives at Nickelodeon weren't too thrilled at the prospect of the main character being a girl, and they asked the creators to make the main character a boy. The Nickelodeon execs thought that boys wouldn't watch a show about a girl. But that's that's not the story Bryke wanted to tell, and they were ready to walk away if the execs didn't back down. Thankfully, test screenings came back positive, with young boys saying that Korra was awesome and Nickelodeon greenlit the show. Initially planned as a miniseries, the creators were given just 12 episodes to tell their story. As such, the first book of The Legend of Korra, which is basically just what they call seasons, ends without much of a cliffhanger. It's kind of just its own self-contained story and wraps up a bit too neatly. But while Bryke and the team were in production for the first season, Nickelodeon ordered 14 more episodes, which would become book two. Then, shortly after the first book finished airing, it was announced that Nickelodeon had ordered 26 more episodes. Now the creators had the space to tell a story more on the level of Avatar The Last Airbender. With three more books after the first one, they could have a more intricate story about Korra's growth over multiple arcs. Korra's first season was good, but now it had the chance to be amazing. However, Nickelodeon was still apprehensive about the show, despite ordering so many episodes. Season 1 ended with one character killing another and killing himself in the process. Not exactly the most child-friendly material. But Book 1 had an average of 3.8 million viewers per episode across the whole season, and premiered its first episode to 4.5 million viewers, which made it one of, if not the, most popular animated shows in 2012. We may never know exactly what the Nickelodeon execs were thinking, but I think it's safe to say they were happy to move forward with the show despite their reservations, thanks to its high ratings. Still, for book two, Nickelodeon decided to move Korra from its coveted Saturday morning slot to a Friday night slot. For an animated show aimed at kids, that really hampered its ratings. A little over a year after book one's finale aired, which is a long wait for a kids show, book two premiered to 2.6 million viewers. It began in the 7 p.m. time slot and about halfway through the season moved to an 8 p.m. time slot instead. Book two ended up averaging about 2 million viewers per episode in 2013. While those were less than stellar ratings compared to its first season, Season, it's also important to note that The Legend of Korra was streaming online at the same time, and its online and social presence was huge. We don't have stats for their online streaming numbers, but viewers could stream the show for free on Nick.com, so the TV numbers alone definitely don't tell the whole story. Book 2 is where The Legend of Korra starts to find its feet. Knowing they have more episodes coming, it starts to set up a lot of arcs that won't be fully resolved until Book 4. Its main villain is lackluster, but the rest of the characters are incredible in the plot is fascinating. Now it's June 27th, 2014, and Book 3 premieres on TV to only 1.5 million viewers. This premiere was announced only about a week in advance and caught a lot of people off guard who thought they wouldn't see an announcement for the premiere of Book 3 until at least Comic-Con at the end of July. But thanks to leaks of a few of the Spanish-dubbed episodes of Korra in early June, it seemed that Nickelodeon decided to air the official episode sooner rather than later. Only the first eight episodes of Book 3 actually made it to TV, though. Suddenly, in the middle of book 3, it was announced that The Legend of Korra was moving online. So episodes 9 to 13 were actually released online only, which many saw as a huge setback for the show. At Comic-Con in 2014, Brian Konietzko explained that the move was actually a part of a larger move to streaming for Nickelodeon, and that Korra did much better online than on TV anyway. He did say that the sudden move to online mid-season caught the creators by surprise and wasn't necessarily done in the smoothest way, but he said it was a plan that had been in place earlier. So in 
August 2014, the Book 3 finale aired online only and fans were unsure what to expect for Book 4. Despite Book 3 being arguably the best season so far, with intense themes, amazing character development, complicated villains, and stunning visuals, Korra's future seemed uncertain. Only two months later, in October 2014, Book 4 premiered online only to incredible support from the fandom. It takes place three years after the events of Book 3, and follows Korra as she copes with her trauma, both physically and mentally. Book 4 is arguably the best in the entire series, and many fans were disappointed that it wouldn't be shown on TV. But then, it was, or at least part of it. Episodes 1 through 8 were online only, but then, in a move that surprised nearly everyone, Korra came back to TV for episodes 9 through 13, except this time it was on the Nicktoons channel at 9pm. So, after starting off on Nickelodeon on Saturday mornings, Korra moved to Friday evenings at 7pm, then Friday evenings at 8pm, then was removed from TV mid-season and only available online, then came back to TV mid-season but on a different channel called Nicktoons at 9pm. Now, if you find that confusing, imagine being a kid just trying to watch your cartoon with that schedule. It doesn't seem like Korra was set up for success by the network. In fact, it seems like the network almost always had a contentious relationship with the show. And in spite of that, it went on to make history. On December 19th, 2014, The Legend of Korra finale was released. And as if the finale was one big metaphor for how the series as a whole was treated by Nickelodeon, it aired at different times depending on how you watched it. It was released online exactly at midnight Eastern Time on Friday, December 19th. So basically really late in the evening on Thursday, December 18th. If you were on the West Coast, you could see it at 9pm on Thursday, December 18th, thanks to time zones. But if you waited to watch it on TV, you wouldn't see it until 10pm on Friday, December 19th. Why the super late time slot? Well, I have a guess. This is Korra and Asami, known by their ship name Korasami. They met in the first book when Asami was dating Mako, the guy that Korra had a crush on. As you can probably guess, this led to some predictable love triangle stuff in the first book, which eventually leads to Mako and Asami breaking up and Mako and Korra start dating. By the end of the second book though, Korra and Mako decide to be just friends, and that's when we start to see things blossom between Korra and Asami in books 3 and 4. In book 3, we see hints of something developing between Korra and Asami as they go through experience experiences that drive them closer together. In the first episode, Korra is sad about her low approval ratings in Republic City, but Asami is there to comfort her. Then Asami teaches Korra how to drive, and Korra says it's nice to have a girlfriend. She means it in the friend that's a girl kind of way at this point, but this is an important scene in that it shows how much they're bonding and making time for each other and being patient with each other. The next episode, Korra needs to go on a mission, so Asami brings her an entire airship. Then Korra splits up from the main group to do her own mission and she only brings Asami with her, showing how much she trusts her. When they get back to Republic City, we see Asami help Korra take out her frustration with some sparring. And when they go on another mission and need to split up, guess who Korra's with? Asami, obviously. When they're attacked and Korra is in a meditative state that they can't get her out of, Asami runs away with her on the back of a polar bear dog to protect her. They end up getting captured and go through a really difficult time together, something that brings them even closer together. Asami then literally rips a metal bar out of the wall to free herself so that she can escape and steal the keys from a guard to free Korra. After that, they crash land in a desert and together figure out a way to escape and find the nearest town. Later, Korra says she needs to go back into a meditative state and Asami immediately offers to watch over her while she's meditating. Then she leaves for a mission and hugs Asami, Mako, and Bolin before she goes, but Asami is the only one she exchanges words with, telling her to be careful. When Korra is badly hurt and poisoned, and Su Yin is trying to pull the poison out of her, the camera pans to the nearby Mako and Asami. While Mako looks worried, Asami looks absolutely distraught and is holding both her hands to her chest because she's so intensely worried about Korra. The next episode skips forward two weeks and we see that Asami has assumed the role of Korra's caretaker, helping her get ready for events and wheeling her around in her wheelchair. She also consoles Korra and lets her know that it's okay that she's not feeling better yet, and she says, I want you to know that I'm here for you. If you ever want to talk, or anything. 
And that's how book three ends. Korra has been through hell, and Asami has been the only one who's been there for her through all of it. The story has clearly established that Asami is the most meaningful relationship in Korra's life. By book four, the hints at Korra and Asami's feelings for each other become even more clear. When Korra leaves Republic City to go to the Southern Water Tribe for two weeks, Asami offers to come with her, despite the fact that she's running a massive company in Republic City, and nobody else offers to go with her. Asami, Mako, and Bolin all write letters to Korra while she's gone, but Asami's is by far the most heartfelt. She writes, Dear Korra, I miss you. It's not the same in Republic City without you. Korra's two-week trip becomes three years long as she copes with her trauma, but at around the two-year mark, she writes back to Asami. She asks Asami not to tell Mako or Bolin that she wrote to her and not them. She says it's easier to talk to Asami about this stuff, meaning her trauma, and that Mako and Bolin wouldn't understand. This is where the show makes clear that Korra's relationship to Asami is unlike her relationship to anyone else. She's more than a close friend. She's the only person Korra really feels okay opening up to. A few episodes later, Later, Korra finally returns to Republic City. She meets up with Asami and Mako at a restaurant. While Mako is at the table, Asami is waiting at the front of the restaurant to greet Korra. Asami compliments Korra's hair, and Korra full-on blushes before saying, You're looking snazzy as always. Which is a cheesy compliment, but a compliment on her appearance nonetheless. I think the blushing really cements this relationship as something more than friends though. Because up until this point, even though Korra and Asami have grown incredibly close, there hasn't really been much that could be interpreted as flirting until this scene. Asami literally compliments Korra's appearance and Korra blushes. If that happened between a guy and a girl, everyone would immediately be hearing wedding bells. But because it happened between two girls, the importance of this scene can be downplayed by some people. But this scene is monumental in terms of moving Korra and Asami's relationship forward, because not only do they connect deeply on an emotional level, but they also find each other attractive. Later that same episode, Korra, Asami, and Mako are in pursuit of some bad guys. And while Mako sits in the passenger seat and yells at both Asami and Korra saying that they're doing the wrong things, Asami and Korra work together perfectly and without words, catching the truck they were chasing with ease. As a viewer, if there was any doubt in your mind about if Korra might go back to Mako, Mako, this scene should really solidify the fact that Asami is the person for Korra. While Mako tells Korra to sit down because he thinks he knows what's best for her, Korra trusts Asami's driving skills to get her close enough to the truck, and Asami trusts Korra's ability to leap down onto the truck. This scene not only moves the plot forward, but it says a lot about who's a better match for Korra, and why your partner should be somebody who encourages you and trusts you rather than someone who doubts your ability. In the next episode, Korra is sitting outside brooding, and Asami comes comes outside to offer her some tea, which is clearly just a flimsy excuse to talk to her. During that conversation, Asami tries to hype Korra up and make her believe in herself. Korra mentions some bad things that have happened, and Asami reminds her of all the good. And then there's the final episode of Book 4, which is the finale for the entire Legend of Korra series. This is the episode that would go down in history. Not only was it the end to an incredible series with intense and thought-provoking plotlines, but it had the potential to be the first first mainstream American kids show to depict two queer female main characters in a relationship together. While other shows may have had background characters be queer or just been lesser known shows in general, The Legend of Korra was in a unique position. This was a very popular show at the time, and even to this day, nearly five years later, it still is. Plus, it's technically a kids show, even though people of all ages love it. While TV shows aimed at an older audience have included queer characters long before The Legend of Korra came around, this was uncharted territory. because there are a good chunk of people who aren't openly hostile to the LGBT plus community, but still find queerness to be something that's only for adults. But it's that prejudice that continues to harm queer people because they grow up not seeing anyone who's like them. Being queer is not inherently adult. Sometimes young girls have crushes on young boys, and when that happens, adults tend to think it's a cute childhood crush. But if a young girl has a crush on a young girl, suddenly it's inappropriate? That's not how it works. Lots of people know that they're queer from a young age, and being able to accept them while they're still young can be incredibly meaningful for them, instead of forcing them to pretend to be something they're not for their entire childhood. That's why having queerness in children's media is so important, and why The Legend of Korra stands out among other shows with queer characters. Because being queer isn't an adult thing, and normalizing queerness for kids will help us all live in a more accepting world. This is part of why it was disappointing that Nickelodeon moved Korra to such a late time slot 
spot for the finale. Even though it was great that they brought it back to TV, having it air at 10pm was a clear attempt at targeting an older audience, since lots of kids would already be in bed by 10pm. So it's now December 18th, 2014. Tons of Legend of Korra fans are on Nick.com ready to stream the finale as soon as it goes live, waiting with bated breath to see if this could actually happen. Because even though we had seen the hints and the development, many of us didn't believe that they'd actually do it, that they'd actually make Korra and Asami canon. The queer community is used to getting queer baited. That is, having queer content teased only for it to not really be queer in the end. So it wouldn't be that surprising if that happened here. Here. And so we wait with anticipation. Some determined that it has to happen, some hopeful but unsure, some ready to be disappointed. And then the episode goes live. If you're on the west coast, it's 9 p.m. on the 18th. If you're on the east coast, the clock has just struck midnight on the 19th. Episode 12, The Day of the Colossus, is first, and it's over before you know it. It's now either 9.30 or 12.30 depending on your time zone, and while the show has been amazing so far, it hasn't confirmed Korasami yet. Next up is episode 13, The Last Stand, and everything culminates in a massive fight in Republic City. Eventually, the dust settles on the final fight. Varric and Julie get married. After the wedding, Korra talks to Mako, and while the words they exchange are super nice, they're obviously platonic, and Korra leaves the wedding to stare emotionally into the distance, which has kind of become her signature thing. At this point, the episode is almost over. Korra's scene with Mako is over, so the fans are 99% sure she isn't getting back with him. That means it has to be Asami, right? Everyone is holding their breath. And then, someone approaches Korra from off-screen, and it's Tenzin. The fandom collectively exhales. Is the story going to end like this? Will Korra have some emotional moment with her father figure and not get a romantic ending like Aang and Katara did in The Last Airbender? But then, Asami interrupts them with a weak excuse about Varric needing to borrow something from Tenzin, and so Tenzin immediately runs off, either oblivious to what's happening or happily getting out of the way for their moment. So it's the final scene, and Korra and Asami are sitting on the stairs, staring out at the beautiful landscape. Asami says she couldn't handle losing Korra, and they hug. Korra then suggests that they go on a vacation, just the two of them, and Asami agrees. So they get changed and approach the spirit portal. Fans everywhere are screaming. This has to be it. This is the romantic ending. Korra and Asami hold hands and step into the yellow glow of the spirit portal, almost as if they're walking off into the sunset. And then they turn turn and face each other in a way that can only be described as romantic. Beautiful music plays in the background and the camera fades upwards into the yellow glow. The end. And so, around the country at 10pm or 1am, fans are screaming with excitement. It wasn't a finale kiss like Aang and Katara had, but it was definitely romantic. They held hands facing each other and faded into the sunset. There's no way that's platonic. Korra and Asami, for many, were confirmed canon at this point, and we were ecstatic. But the drama wasn't over. In the days following the finale, most Korasami shippers were over the moon, but some Legend of Korra viewers weren't convinced. They thought the hand-holding was platonic, and they weren't ready to call Korasami canon, and so there was some doubt. Then, about four days later, the creators of the series, Brian and Mike, each posted separately to their respective Tumblr accounts. Brian's post was called, Korasami is canon, while Mike's was titled, Korasami confirmed. In these two posts, the creators definitively stated that Korra and Asami are in a romantic relationship. That is officially canon. On top of that, Brian's post is lengthy and goes into more detail. He says that they never intended for Korra to get back with Mako, and that as Korra and Asami's relationship progressed, they thought it made sense for the story for them to become a couple, and so they alluded to it throughout the second half of the series. It wasn't a last-minute decision to make the fans happy. It was something that was planned much earlier on. He says that they approached the network about having Korra and Asami together, and the network was supportive to a degree. I think that's why we got the hand-holding and facing each other rather than a kiss. The network probably wouldn't let them go as far as a kiss, but they would let them heavily allude to it in other ways. Brian says that he asked the composer to make the music romantic and tender, and they framed the hand-holding shot as a direct callback to the shot of Varric and Julie getting married just a few minutes earlier. He even says that while it's not a slam dunk for queer representation, 
it is hopefully a somewhat significant inching forward. Korra went as far as it could while airing on Nickelodeon, and while the fans may have wanted more, it was a big step nonetheless. Kids who stayed up to watch the finale on Nicktoons when it aired on TV later on December 19th would see that Korra and Asami had a special romantic connection. It's something that parents could talk to their kids about and explain that sometimes women love women and that's okay and normal. That's a big deal for a kids show in 2014. And of course you can make all sorts of arguments about how the intention of the creator affects how you should interpret a piece of media, and more often than not I would side with the audience's interpretation over the creator's intention, but in this instance I think the creator's intent is important because of the limitations put on them by the network. Had the creators not been limited by Nickelodeon, I think we would have had a more obvious, undeniably queer ending to The Legend of Korra. Obviously, I don't know for sure what went on behind the scenes, but that's my best guess using the information available to us. And while normally I'd say that if you want something to be more obvious in the show, you should make it more obvious in the show, I think that's exactly what Bryke tried to do. When they possibly were told they couldn't end it with a kiss, they did everything else they could to point to it being romantic. They had Korra and Asami confide in each other in a way they don't confide in anyone else. They had Korra and Asami in the final scene together mirroring the last airbender's ending with Aang and Katara. They even put Korra and Asami in the same pose as Varric and Julie had during their wedding. In fact, there's a couple other times that pose is used, and it's always romantic. Kuvira and Batar Jr. hold hands like that when planning to get married. Plea and Zaheer hold hands like that when telling each other how much they love each other. And yeah, Kuvira does shoot Batar with a giant cannon, and Plea is murdered by Su Yin before Zaheer is imprisoned, but the point is, at the moment they used that pose, it was always to display romantic feelings for each other. The creators even used the music in the final scene with Korra and Asami to hint at their feelings. The song at the end of The Last Airbender, when Aang and Katara kiss, is called The Avatar's Love. And in the score for the final scene of The Legend of Korra, even though it's an original song, you can hear bits that are reminiscent of The Avatar's Love in it. The notes are similar, and the instrument used for those notes, a kalimba, isn't used much over the course of the two series except in these songs. Here's a short clip from the Aang and Katara song. And here's the similar clip from the Korasami song. You'll also notice that the end of the Korasami song sounds like a slowed down version of the notes from the Avatar's Love. Obviously, the Avatar's love wasn't just copy-pasted into the finale song for The Legend of Korra, but the music is intentionally calling back to that. It's an effort to point the viewer towards Korra and Asami's relationship being romantic not only from a storytelling or framing perspective, but from a musical one as well. And I think all of those aspects of creator intention matter because they were trying so hard to point the viewer in a specific direction, even if heteronormativity might make some people ignore all of that. And so, that's how The Legend of Korra made history. After a slow start with the first two books, followed by issues actually being on TV with books three and four, The Legend of Korra finally managed to have a finale air online and on TV in which the two main female characters end up in a relationship together. It may not have been the biggest win ever for queer representation, but it was an important one, making it just a little bit easier for future kids shows to introduce queer characters. And I know that to many people, myself included, The Legend of Korra was incredibly powerful in helping us figure out who we are and accepting that about ourselves. I should also mention that even though The Legend of Korra TV show is over, the story still continues in graphic novel form. Quick spoiler warning here for those books. In a three-part series called Turf Wars, that's turf with a U, Korra and Asami are confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt to be queer. In these books, which are officially licensed and canon, Korra and Asami kiss, Korra introduces Asami to her parents as her girlfriend, and has a whole awkward coming out thing with them, and Kaya, Aang's daughter, comes out as queer when talking to Korra and Asami. They're really incredible books, and I would highly recommend them if you enjoyed The Legend of Korra TV show. This is not sponsored, I just love this series and these books so much. There's also another Legend of Korra graphic novel series called Ruins of the Empire, with part one already being available and part two on its way, but I haven't had a chance to pick up that series yet, so I can't say much about it. Anyway, if you liked this video, I 
could really use your support over on Patreon. These videos take a lot of time and effort to produce, and I put them on YouTube for free, which means I'm funded largely by the folks over on Patreon. So if you appreciated this lengthy look into the story behind The Legend of Korra, it would mean the world to me if you could support me on Patreon and help me make more videos like this. You can also give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe, and share it with a friend if you want. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.